Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Ken, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church, and welcome. Thank you all for being a part of today's celebration. And to all those that are tuning in online with us, thank you for taking time out of your busy days to be a part of what God's doing here. We would love to see you one of these days face to face. Well, guys, we've been in a series, and this is a big deal. This is huge. This is something we got to get right. The series is called Koinonia, and I know that, that term may have been unfamiliar, but I'm hoping by the end of this series that it's something that all of us have embraced, the reality of what it is, and allowing God to move in us, to make it a truth that's evident for all to see. Because Koinonia is the community that love builds. It is the vision that Jesus had in mind. He said, I will build my ecclesia, my church, which is a gathering, it's a community, it's people that are called out of darkness, that have been united by Christ together. Where once we might not have had anything in common, but now all of us share the common reality that Christ is in us, the hope of our glory. The realization what united all of us together and which is why we can love one another is because we've all shared in something. All of us have sinned, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, but God freely redeemed us. He freely saved us. He freely justified us by the grace of the cross. And so what we have experienced, that's what God's idea was. What we freely receive, what unites all of us together. We live in a broken world. We were all broken, but we experience grace. We experience love demonstrated for us by what Jesus did for us on the cross. And because love is a reciprocal word, Love is about giving and receiving, that God's intention was that you and I would both learn to give and receive love. And that's why Jesus, before he left the earth, said, the one command that I give you. In other words, this is the big idea. This is, if you, nothing else matters except getting this one right. Love one another as I have loved you. He defined the reality that loving was the responsibility of doing it as he did. And isn't that what it means to be a follower of Jesus? A desire in our heart to be like him. To not just know him, but to live the life that he designed and created us to live. That's what God invited us into, because why? Love is a community word. It's about reciprocal. It's about giving and receiving. That God is love, and God is community. And so when we learn to live this way, we learn to live the life we were created to live. We learn to live like God. And that's why in the Godhead, even though there are three divine personalities, they love so dearly, so fulfillingly that they become as one. And we, the church, need to get this right. That's why Jesus prayed that we would be one. Why? Because that's how the world will know that God sent Jesus to the world. That's why this is a big deal. God matures us. He grows us. He develops us within the aspect of community. And we need to get this right. So today, what we're going to be talking about, what we learned last week, we started in that the disciples, the apostles, the one responsible for writing encouragement to the followers of Jesus, what became known as the New Testament. But these writings were to define for the followers of Jesus, what does it look like to love like Jesus? And so they gave us the one another passages. In other words, these are the things that we need to focus on. What it, re what it reveals to us is that God has many ways that he wants us to express love one to another. And that's why these are important. And today we're looking at one of the most central ones, serve one another. In other words, the night that Jesus had said to the disciples that they were to love one another as he had loved, he had already demonstrated. He had already gone out of his way to reveal to them what that looked like. Because if you remember the night, the night was what we call traditionally the night of the Last Supper. But they were experiencing a Passover meal together. And yet that night, the common courtesy of coming together, nobody had done what was normal and customary at that time, which is washing feet. Why? Because that was a lowly job. That was reserved for servants. And what was Jesus proving that night? That everybody in that room was struggling with the idea that that was beneath them. But what did Jesus do? 
The Bible said he wanted to, to show his followers the full extent of his love. So he got up from the supper table. He took off his robe. And what did that represent? His robe represented he was a rabbi. He was a, that his followers, they identified his uh, authority by his garment. Now we do that in society today, right? People in uniform, people like a police officer, their garments represent their authority. You go into a hospital, you want to talk to the guy with the white coat, okay? You don't want somebody diagnosing you just, mm, what do you have? No, you want to talk. But what? Our garments sometimes represent that end. Jesus laid that aside, and then he took the lowest position of all, and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. And then he said to them when he was in, do you know why I did this? If they were honest. They would say, no, we have no idea why you did that. Because you could have heard a pin drop in the room that night. But he said to them, I am your savior, I am your Lord and master. And that is true. He said, if I have done this for you, this is the example that I leave you. You need to do this for one another. And blessed will you be if you do this. And so that's why it's important that you and I recognize. This is the big idea today, if you're taking notes with me. Serving others is an honor, not a duty. Serving others is an honor, not a duty. Now be honest today. When we think of serving, we more think of duty than we think of honor. And here, the Bible is giving us an understanding that it's a mindset. There is something you and I need to grab a hold of. It's something that we need to begin to train our thinking to be in line with kingdom principles. Because the Bible teaches us that the transformation of our lives is tied to the renewing of our minds. And so that's why the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because if we're honest... Our problems start right here, right between our temples. It's the way we think. It's the way we f filter life. It's the way we look at situations around us. And he's saying that to have the mind of Christ is to recognize, although Jesus was God in a bod, he never used that to his advantage. He never thought, hey, listen, I'm coming into the situation. I'm God. Get out of the way. No, you're here to serve me. No, Jesus demonstrated the direct opposite. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of a man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself unto death, even death by a cross. So to be a follower of Jesus is to recognize that serving others is our highest ideal. That's what it means to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus. Jesus. Now, be honest with me for a moment. Serving is not always something we want to do. But let me ask you, the night of the Last Supper, do you think it was something Jesus wanted to do, like he just felt like doing it? If you read it in John 13, and you put it into context, the Bible says specifically, Jesus knew what was awaiting him. He knew this was the last night he was going to be with them, and the sufferings to which he would have to endure. Jesus knew the scriptures better than any of the other followers. He knew what Isaiah said, that he would be pierced for our transgressions. He would be bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that would bring us peace with God would be upon him. The Bible says, see, you think, oh, that was easy. He was God. No, the Bible also says he was every way human as we are. That's why that night he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. How many times have you been stressed out about what's in front of you that you broke capillaries in your brain and your blood came through your sweat? I doubt any of us in this room have ever experienced that. That was what was on Jesus' mind. But despite that, even though he was in his darkest hour, he wanted to show the full extent of his love and was willing to allow his life to be the model that he wanted others to follow. He didn't consider serving a duty. It was an honor because he wanted to show the full extent of his love. It's a mindset. Because why? It's totally opposite of the world we live in. I mean, be honest with me. The world that you and I live in, everybody wants people to serve you. And whenever you've been served by people, it is nice. 
you can get very used to that very quickly. But the problem that we have to face, what we deal with in our world, is that the idea of serving others sometimes seems beneath us. And when we graduate, the more we are uh, 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 um, accomplished in life, the more we've uh, uh, done in life, the more we almost gain the understanding that we think it is the right of others to serve us. And so you have to fight that. That's why it is a mindset. Look what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians. Galatians 5 and 13, he said this. Now this was a church that Paul had planted in modern day Turkey. Galatia was a region and here are these followers of Jesus. He's giving them instructions. This is where he begins to define the idea of what it means to love like Jesus. He said, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Isn't it true in Christ? We learn we're no longer slaves to sin and to Satan, right? We've been made free. And the Bible teaches us that we need to stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. That's how he started this chapter. But then he goes on to say, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Whenever you see the term flesh there in the, in, in the New Testament, it's talking about the fallen human nature of uh, all of us. Because this is something every one of us struggle with, whether we admit it or not. Because why? Your flesh, all of us have desires. All of us have things we want and we like. And when you give in to your desires, the amazing thing, if we're honest is that no matter how much you feed it, it always wants more. No matter how good it is, you are never satisfied. You want more and more and more. It's like your body desires sleep, you give it more sleep, and guess what? It's never, it's never satisfied. It wants more. You know, you sit at the dinner table, that was a good supper. Are you satisfied? No, you want generally more. We, well, the more you feed your human nature, the more it wants. And so what, what he's trying to define for us is this. It's not freedom from, it's freedom to. In other words, we're not free from serving others. We're free to serve others. Because if you allow your fallen human nature to control you, you'll become the center of your universe. You'll think everybody owes you something. You'll think that everybody is there to serve and to meet your needs. Because if you go down, if you drill down into what creates relational pain, Relational pain has one big title. It's called selfishness. It is the root of the problem of human beings. That's where we create pain. Where do arguments arise from? When you don't think you're getting what you believe you should be getting, if somebody's not treating you the way you think you should be treated, you have a problem. And whenever we allow the situation, then we become the center of our universe then we begin to look at other situations like I am owed something. And the truth be told, okay, God, people even pull that on God, like God owes us something. People get angry at God because things didn't go the way I thought they should go. And the reality is that God owes us nothing. God gave everything to us freely. But when you become the center of your world, that's a dangerous place. Because you know what, you know where you never see selfishness? You know where that is? In the mirror. It is easy to see in everyone else around you. And that's what angers you. Do you believe how they're acting? Do you believe? But we never see that in ourselves. And he says here, brothers and sisters, you're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. But here's the rather. In other words, here's how you should handle it. This is the way that you combat that. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. See, humility doesn't come natural to us as human beings. Humility is something you have to work at. Humility is something you have to, it's, it's a mindset. It's the willingness to go down low. And what we begin to discover in the kingdom of God is the way up is down. See, the world is all about me first. But now you have to fight that mentality. And how do you fight it? By learning to serve one another humbly in love. Because why? In verse 14, he says this. For the entire law 
is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Aren't you glad the New Testament made things so much simpler? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be a bummer to have to memorize 613 commands? I mean, no, the Bible gives us this realization, just one. Just center on this one. Now, it's easy to remember, it's harder to do. But you fulfill everything that God ever would require of a human being if you just get this one right. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So whenever you feel yourself wanting something, that's your cue to go give it to somebody else. Ooh. Ouch. And so that's what he's, because look at verse 15. For if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. There's nothing more entertaining sometimes to watch than a good church fight. Because the people, honestly, guys, it's what made us so vulnerable to the world we live in. We come in, oh, I love your brother and all. Then somebody doesn't do something you think they should do. We don't even fight fair. We kiss somebody, oh, you're the best, and wait till they walk away before you stab them in the back. Okay? And the reality of it is when we get upset, we can be mean and nasty. You don't believe me? Just check Twitter feeds. Just check Facebook. Oh, my goodness. It is amazing because one thing we're not short of is opinions. And we don't care what our opinion because we feel we're entitled to our opinions. And I'm going to let you know in all caps because my opinion matters more than anybody else. And the fact of the matter is Jesus demonstrated something for us. That to be a follower of Jesus is the willingness to look around and see whatever is needed and say, you know what? It's not somebody else's responsibility to meet that need. Here am I. God, use me. Because if you're taking notes with me, look at, look at, look at this. Okay? Serving others humbly in love, okay, is the antidote to selfishness. I mean, if we're honest, okay, I mean, we are in church, you can't confess. We all struggle with this, okay? We all struggle with being selfish. Because honestly, true love is when you serve when you don't feel like serving, when it's not convenient to serve. And I struggle with that. Sometimes my wife asks me to do something, and down, frankly, I don't feel like doing it. But will I love her or will I love myself? That's the question we all have to ask. Because if we ever took on the responsibility to humble ourselves and serve, we would, number one, be like Jesus, which is the goal. That's what, see, we should all be willing to come into this place. This is the training wheels of life. If you can't do it here, what makes you think we can do it anywhere else? But if we learn to do it, because you know what? When you drive in, when you come in on a Sunday, do you know what it takes to be able to do all that has to happen here on a Sunday? Okay? There are a whole bunch of things that have to take place for all of us to be able to sit here and enjoy. But when you are sitting and enjoying, has it ever dawned on you, what can I do to make this a reality? Or is this the responsibility of everybody else to take care of me? Ouch, he stopped preaching, he's gone to meddling. But the truth is, you have to be willing because Jesus demonstrated this. Title, privilege, what you feel you deserve. Jesus did what? The night of the Last Supper, he took all of that off. So whatever we think we bring into this place, when we want to be like Jesus, it's a willingness to lay that aside, don a towel and figure, where can I serve someone else? See, you bring your kids in, you want to check them into children's church, and there's nobody there. Before you get angry and say, why isn't somebody there? Maybe the answer is looking you in the mirror. Maybe the answer is like, ma'am, I am here to do whatever is needed. How many of you ever thought about, you drive into the parking lot, all the people that make the parking lot a reality? You're like, I would never do that. If Pastor Ken asked me to stand up on the platform, yeah, I'm ready to do that. But serve there? 
oh, okay, being like Jesus wasn't really the goal. Being like Jesus wasn't what motivated us. See, the center of our world, the only way you can truly deal with selfishness is the willingness to humble yourself and serve even when you don't feel like it, even when it's inconvenient. See, all of us, we have opportunity to allow this to be flourished or grow or matured in our life everywhere we turn because don't tell me this. If you were in a, think about all of the relational arguments that have ever come up. What's at the heart of them? Somebody feeling like I didn't get what I deserve. You're not treating me like I think you should be treating me. Imagine if we allowed just the mindset of, listen, instead of looking for something, I'm looking to give. I'm looking to serve. I'm looking to do. Imagine if you're in a marriage, okay, think about this. How many marriageal arguments would stop if you just started serving your spouse? Not looking for something, not serving going, I'm looking for something, okay, if you're a guy, tonight. No, no, serving just purely with no strings attached. Being like Jesus saying, you know what, I see there's a need, therefore I'm going to take off my responsibilities. I'm going to don a towel and I'm going to meet that need. Imagine what a marriage would look like that looked like that. Imagine if you lived in your neighborhood and you weren't upset that your neighbor didn't do something you thought they should do, but you went out of your way and began to do what they were unwilling to do and serve them purely out of the love of Christ, humbling yourself. Imagine what your neighborhood could become like. Or if you went into your workplace, you're like, Pastor Ken, Nobody lives like that. Why? Because he said, if you bite and devour one another, you ever hear dog eat dog, eat dog world? That means when you're looking out for number one. If you're honest, most of the time we figure, nobody cares about my issues. I'm going to take care of it myself. If I don't get mine, then I'm never going to. See, if you are on the process of thinking, I have to do it all, then you are not trusting God. God said that the way up is down. How do you get your needs met? That's the problem. We're like, I don't do that because people will use me. People will abuse me. Excuse me? The last time I looked, Jesus didn't consider it a duty, Jesus considered it an honor. And you and I need to realize, how does God truly meet our needs? See, if you're content, if your needs are your focus, you know what the subject of that sentence is? You. And that's the problem. Whenever you are at the center of the situation, you actually prohibit God from doing what only God can do. And I tell people this all the time. How do you get your needs met? Find other needs and meet them. You give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's what it means to trust God. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. Giving is, is love in action. God so loved the world that he what? gave. Jesus displayed love because he was willing to to serve. He did for us what we couldn't do. And so how do you deal with your selfishness? The question I ask all the time, just check up on yourself. Where are you serving? Where are you going out of your way to do just for the sake of doing? If you do that, that's how you trust God. God will mean, and I tell people, this is the part of it. I've heard this again and 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 again over the years. The people who get that, they realize, you know what, when I go out to serve others, I have found God, that's when he meets my needs. You see, when you are constantly thinking about your needs and getting my needs met, what you don't recognize is that God is the one responsible for meeting your need. And if you are trying to get your needs met, that's the problem. You is the subject of the sentence. And until you can get out of the way, God can't get in the way to actually do what only he can do. But when you serve the needs of other people, then you can trust because the Bible says God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. 
Oh, you haven't read that? It's in the book. I encourage you to be a Bible reader. Here's the point. God knows any good thing any man doeth, he doeth unto the Lord, and the Lord will reward him. Sometimes you have to check up on your motivations. If I'm serving others because I think there's something in it for me, then I'm serving for the wrong reasons. The, how the love of Christ operate in me, there's a humility side. There's a point that says, you know what? I'm just going to do it for the pure sake of loving God. That's the antidote to selfishness. It's selflessness. The way you cut self out is to humble yourself and do whatever's needed. Guys, there are opportunities just today before you leave this place. There are places you can serve the needs of others. Anybody that walks into any supermarket anywhere, just look around. Find some single moms who have more kids and groceries than they can handle and just help them meet a need. That there's nobody, there is so many ways to be able to serve in our world. When we begin to serve humbly, out of love, do you know what? If you're taking notes, this is important. Serving others humbly is most embodies Jesus. It's how Jesus is most revealed and seen in our world. That's when we truly become the body of Christ. You see, and there are so many ways. That's what I love about it, when people serve just purely out of the sake of, not as a duty, but as an honor. Man, God, you give me the opportunity to do this. It's amazing. Thank you, because why? Christ is being formed in me. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. It's swimming upstream, because in the world that we live in, honor and dignity, people think, is when other people serve you. But the kingdom of God thinks it's entirely the opposite. The, entire, the, the kingdom of God actually thinks in this way. That when I serve others is the way I most make Jesus known in my world. And that's why Jesus said, when others see your good works, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's when we become the light of the world. That's, see, that's why the church needs to get this right. Because the thing that the Bible said that we should be known by this more than anything else. Jesus said by this, by your love for one another, Will, all, will the world know that you're my followers? That's why this is huge. It's a, it's a big deal. Imagine with me for a moment. Because when this is embodied, I remember this. Years ago I read this. But a man was praying and asking God, God, please help me to understand the difference between heaven and hell. And he wrote this in an experience that he had a vision. And in the vision he felt like in this question, God said, all right, I'll answer you. So he saw Jesus Walk him down this hallway, and there was a big door with a glass uh, window in the door. And he said, look in here. And he looked into this, this uh, place, and there was this beautiful banquet. All of this, you know, food that was just, you know, just would, anybody would love and be satisfied. It's just amazing. But everybody who was seated around this table was a big circle, okay? There was a gulf between them and the food. And every person who came in was given two 10-foot poles, which could reach the food. But the problem was this. When he looked into this one window, everybody was trying to stab the food and get it to their own mouth. But the 10-foot poles made it so that they couldn't get anything. And they were frustrated. And they were angry. And they were, they were hungry. And they were ornery. And it, was, and it just was such a hard... It, people were, were, were starving. And they were getting more and more frustrated because the more they were trying to serve themselves, they couldn't get to the food. And the Lord looked at him and said, that's hell. Now he said to him, walk down this hallway. And he looked in to the second doorway that had the window in it. And he saw the same exact setting. And in this setting, again, the food was in the middle. And everybody around the circle, there was this gulf between them. And everybody had two 10-foot poles. But in this particular room, everybody was happy. Everybody was well fed. There was joy everywhere. Why? And he said, just watch for a minute. And all of a sudden, they would take their 10-foot poles out, reach the food, and serve one another. He said, if you want to know the difference between heaven and hell, is that love cares more about the needs of others than it cares about itself. Hell is when you're only bent on serving yourself. And the fact of the matter is, when you and I get this right, we embody Jesus. That's why I'm proud. One of the things... Our outreach teams, when we take Jesus beyond the walls, see, if we can't even serve in an environment where other people who say they're Christ followers are all on the same path of learning to love one another like Jesus loves, the world desperately needs to see us be 
Christ in the midst of it. And so our outreach teams respond to things. I want, to, I want you to watch this video with me for a moment. Watch this. My name is Tavana Stewart. I have two amazing, beautiful daughters. My oldest daughter name is Harmony and she's seven years old. And my youngest is Journey and she's one. In January, I was, I remember I just uh, purchased this apartment and I was super excited because I was ready to move out the other apartment. After I signed my lease, I went to work and then on my way home from work, I'm not sure why, but something just told me to go to my friend's house. I was woken up from phone calls from Harmony's dad and he was like, I, I think you should call and check on the kids. Then I finally got a hold of uh, my kid's grandmother and then she said that the house was on fire. When I found out the house was burned down, I my heart just dropped. I didn't, I just felt numb. I didn't know what to feel. Just like all our stuff is in there. I didn't know what to do or who to reach out to to help. I called my mom and I just told her what happened. If she's like me immediately, she just started thinking what to do next. And she was like, you know what? You need to call our church. I called Vertical Church and I got a call back that some people would be coming over with some stuff to help. And I didn't know what to really to expect. The outreach team from Vertico had came in with a bunch of stuff. I don't have family here, so that day I just, it felt so natural. It felt like family was coming over to help us. That was more than just help. That was, that was a huge amount of love. I just remember standing in the kitchen when everyone was setting everything up for us and I just wanted to just break down and cry because it felt like a miracle. <laughs> we ended up receiving a whole load of toys and dolls and just so bikes and everything. My kids were so excited. <laughs> that was like the best day ever. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, we're more thankful than I could even say or put into words, but I just would really just want to say thank you and I appreciate you and I love you all. <laughs> You see, what Tavana didn't tell you in her testimony was this. She had to make an adult decision. The place she was living in, she considered to be inadequate for her children. It was unsafe. And, uh, so she had to sacrifice. Her kids did not experience a regular Christmas because the money she would have normally have spent or taking care of her kids. She had to secure a new lease, a new place to go. And in the opportunity, before they had the chance to move, the fire burned down. They lost everything. And so when we got the call, Pastor Frank came to me. I said, listen, we have our outreach team. We have our partners. Ralphie, one of the members here at Vertical Church, runs the furniture co-op. I'm like, guys, just let our, our, our operations team go into, op go into effect. And I'm going to tell you, nothing embodied Jesus more when you feel you're like guys like John or Izzy or Paul Bronson or all these ones that say, you know what? We're here to show the love of Jesus, not in what we say only, but in a way in which we serve. And when they discovered that the kids didn't have Christmas, here's something beautiful as well. That we, we just had gone through the Christmas season and there was toys that was raised. Ralphie's like, guys, I got it. And so they went and got a bike for her daughter. They got a, a Hot Wheels for the other. They got dolls and other things. Not only did God furnish their apartment, not only did God meet them at their point of need, not only, but he also gave those children a Christmas they otherwise would have missed. And how did that happen? Because people here were willing to humble themselves and show love by their service. It embodies Jesus. 
So why? Why do we do it? If you're taking notes, listen to me. Serving others humbly in love expresses gratitude to God. That's how we say thank you to God. See, when you love others is how you actually show love for God. Like any parent will tell you, when you love on my children, you are showing me you care about me. Because whenever you care about the people that you love the most, you are feeling so indebted, so overwhelmed, so that your heart just explodes when you begin to realize. And the way we as human beings express love for God is when we love what God loves, when we show service because it's not a duty, it's an honor. God, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Thank you for what you did for me. I'm not going to be someone who's ungrateful for what you did. I'm going to express my gratitude by the way I serve others. And so all of us, guys, all of us have gifts. If you think I don't have gifts, then you're not being honest with yourself and you're not being honest with Almighty God. God has placed in each of us gifts by which we are to serve one another. And for the sake of time, listen, go to the next point. Listen, this is it. We need to see. God gave us gifts to make a difference in the lives of others. See, all of us, we're given unique things by God. If you don't know what they are, that's what Engage is all about. You can learn how you are uniquely crafted and how we can put you on the dream team. Listen, serving others isn't a duty. is isn't because, oh my God, I'm going to shame you into doing something. No, it's how we become like Jesus. It's how we allow God to fashion and form in us maturity and growth as followers of Christ. It's how love grows. You can't grow love until you give it away. It's not true love until you express it to somebody else freely. And that's how God grows his church. That's how the community that love builds, fashions, and forms. It's in that end. But you see, the problem lies in this. And this is the last point. Listen, listen, listen. Greatness. Serving, serving is spiritual greatness. It's a message that Jesus attempted multiple times to get across to his disciples. It's something that, if, you, if they were honest, I mean, I love the Bible for its transparency. But do you know, when you read the New Testament, when you read the, the stories, the Gospels, the, the stories of the life of Jesus, what you'll discover is that his closest followers, okay, had wrong motivations. Why do I say that? Because one day Jesus called him out. Imagine how embarrassing this would be. Jesus stops one day and says, hey, guys, what were you fighting, back, what were you fighting about way back there on the road before? And they didn't want to admit it. But what they were fighting about is who is the greatest among them, Right? And Jesus begins to instill in them a kingdom mentality. And he says to them that the people in the world that we are in, they define greatness by how many people serve you. But the kingdom of God is not that way. The kingdom of God is that greatness is defined by how many people you serve. He said, because the greatest among you is the servant of all. For the Son of Man came not into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life. And be honest with me, friends. The thing, this is an occupational hazard for me because I oversee a lot of funerals. But do you know what people don't talk about at funerals? What somebody possessed, what they had, how much money was in their accounts, how many toys were in their house or in their car, how much things, and if you think about the time and the attention we give to the stuff we pursue, but do you know what people talk about? How much of their life they gave away. How much they served other people. When people eulogize other people, what they remember most, what's most endearing, what's most meaningful, is when people have used their life to make a difference in the lives of others. And spiritual greatness is defined by serving. See, there's only th that's the only thing you can actually take with you from this planet. The love that you express to one another the way you express love for God is with the way you serve others. But do you know why this is important? Because Luke 22 tells us this, that the same night, the night of the Last Supper, the disciples were still arguing. This hadn't been one time, two times, over three times. In the New Testament, we read in the, in the Gospels, at least three different times, Jesus had attempted to instruct them and to help them to understand that their way of thinking was wrong. The kingdom of God was not like that. But on the last night, the last opportunity that he would have to brand them and give them the understanding that they would not forget. Because Luke tells us 
that at the night of the Last Supper, they were still arguing who would be the greatest. And Jesus said, the greatest among you is servant of all. And why could he say that that night? Because he had already demonstrated greatness because he had taken off his robe. He had donned a towel and he had left the example. He said, who is greatest? He who sits at the table and in the world setting, that's how we define greatness. Who's at the table? But God said, no, it's not the one at the table. It's the one who serves the table. Because Jesus said, the one who's greatest is it the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Tonight, I have left you with the demonstration. Tonight, I have given you the example that true greatness will never be attained in any other way than the humble willingness to go low and serve when nobody else wants to. It's not somebody else's responsibility, the opportunity to say, here am I. God, if there's a need, I'm not pointing at everybody else's saying it's their responsibility why don't they do it see he said if you bite and devour one another watch out you will be destroyed one of another but imagine with me if there was a church the people came in and said need no problem I'll take off whatever I think I should be. I'll serve in the children. I'll serve in the parking lot. Wherever the need is, I get the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to do this. This is Christ. The area to say, you know what? I'm going to get together out of my time, and I'm going to go out on the weekends. I'm going to go out during the weeknights. I'm going to serve on our outreach team. I'm going to go on a mission trip and be Jesus to the least of the people that will never be able to thank me, people that will never be able to experience the opportunity to say, oh, we're so grateful that we want to do something for you. No, the willingness to give with no strings attached is the epitome of what it means to be like Jesus. That is spiritual greatness. Imagine with me, if we became known that way in this community, I can tell you what would happen. There would be lines out because people would want to go. They want to know, first of all, is it for real? And you know what would happen for all those people who got in line? All the ones who were normally coming here would get out of line and let them go first and willingly give up their seat. Instead of getting upset that someone else was sitting in my seat. Oh, my God, he's going to meddling again. No, the willingness to say, you know what? My greatest opportunity, my greatest honor is not when people serve me. But it's, Lord, what can I do to make a difference in my world? Because spiritual greatness is defined in my willingness to serve others humbly. See, humility, that's how we can do it. All of us can walk away today. You can walk into your homes. You can walk into your businesses. You can walk into your neighborhoods. You can find a million and one ways to meet the needs of others if you simply stop looking at myself and just look around you and say, here am I, Jesus. Live your life through me. Imagine what the world would look like. Imagine what difference we could make. In the midst of a dark and perverse generation, we could actually give hope to people desperately in need. That's why, guys, this is a huge issue. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven.